Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. With just 32 days until the presidential election, former President Donald Trump is in battleground Georgia right now as the state and region recovers from the devastation of Hurricane Helene. And just moments ago, he attended a briefing in Columbia County with Governor Brian Kemp. Mr. Trump just delivered remarks in Evans, Georgia, lambasting the White House's response to the crisis. It comes as local and federal officials are now pushing back against a series of incendiary and baseless claims by the former president about the Biden administration's handling of the recovery. Here's some of what he said at a Michigan rally yesterday. Look. People are dying in North Carolina. They're dying all over those five, six states. They're dying and they're getting no help from our federal government because they have no money, because their money's been spent on people that should not be in our country. They stole the FEMA money just like they stole it from a bank so they could give it to their illegal immigrants that they want to have vote for them this season. Now, according to a website FEMA set up to counter similar rumors on social media, no money is being diverted for disaster response. And without naming the former president, FEMA administrator Dan Criswell pushed back hard this afternoon from the ground in North Carolina. There's a lot of misinformation about the fact that we, we are not going to have enough money because it's being redirected elsewhere. Just plain false. And the second part I want to say is it we have resources for individuals. We want them to apply for assistance. This level of misinformation creates the scenario where they won't even come to us. They won't even register. And I need people to register so they can get yeah. what they're eligible for through our programs. And the former president's claims have also been refuted by local officials. Here's what the mayors of two of the area's hardest hit, Asheville, North Carolina, and Greenville, South Carolina, told me yesterday right here on this program. Well, FEMA's been here uh, right on the spot, as you would, as you would hope, uh, very granular. It's the way they work, and that's encouraging to see. But a lot of federal assistance and combined with local in terms of uh, feeding programs, getting emergency assistance in terms of bottled water and things like that. We are now seeing um, an incredible uptick of activity here in Asheville and Buncombe County and in our region. Um, with all sorts of resources coming into the area. Um, I just was meeting with uh, part of our FEMA team that is here. Now, the former president's latest baseless claims on disaster aid come after earlier this week, he claimed without evidence that aid was being denied to areas that voted for him in North Carolina. There is no evidence support that claim. Here's RNC co-chair Laura Trump on this show. He said individuals... Uh, were being denied aid in North Carolina because they voted for him. My colleague Garrett Hake pressed him, asked him where he was getting that information from yesterday. He didn't answer. Do you have evidence? Do you know where those claims are coming from? I actually do not. This is a vital situation. And unfortunately, we have seen a lot more death, I think, than predicted. So I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about any of those statistics. The former president earlier this week also falsely claiming that Georgia Governor Brian Kemp was unable to reach President Biden, even though Kemp told reporters he did speak to the president and told him we got what we need. Mr. Trump's baseless claims about politicizing federal disaster relief come as Politico's e, e News reports that as president, Mr. Trump initially refused to approve disaster aid for the deadly 2018 California wildfire, specifically because of that state's Democratic leanings. A former Trump administration official told them he changed his mind after being showed voting results in Trump-aligned areas in the region. Let's bring in now our NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster is following Donald Trump and Brian Kemp in Georgia. Marissa Parra is in eastern Tennessee, about 60 miles north of Asheville. Dasha Burns is in Butler, Pennsylvania, ahead of Trump's rally there tomorrow. And Garrett Hake, normally on the Trump beat, is in Flint, Michigan, ahead of Kamala Harris's rally later there today. Shaq, let me start with you. As we talked about, Donald Trump is spending the afternoon in Georgia, not technically a campaign event. He's there with Brian Kemp. What were your key takeaways? Obviously, Brian Kemp uh, didn't initially endorse Donald Trump. Now he has. What were your takeaways? Yeah, I think we got some evidence of that truce between these two leaders. You know, we just heard uh, Brian Kemp and former President Trump here behind me. And you heard former President Trump 
praised the governor of Georgia, saying that he's doing a fantastic job earlier in the day, saying that this is someone who is working night and day for the people of Georgia. During this trip, we saw the former president go and meet with volunteers and first responders. He got briefed by some county officials on the exact damage uh, in this area. I'll tell you, even coming in this morning, you saw that while the recovery is well underway, the roads are clear, you still see the impact of this hurricane. Big trees falling over, uh, some electricity and power issues still ongoing in this area. But you continue to hear the former president repeat those claims uh, that are baseless, that the FEMA director has pushed back against, but saying that essentially money has been redirected to migrants. Listen to a little bit of what we heard. Again, what that false claim uh, he's been saying. It's been a, a terrible response from the White House. Uh, they're missing a billion dollars that was used for another purpose, and nobody's seen anything like that. Now, from that standpoint, it's been terrible. Once again, you have the FEMA director saying that is not the case, that it would be illegal, essentially, for FEMA to use disaster response money for different purposes, and that what the former president could be talking about is essentially a congressionally mandated program that FEMA administers but did not come from any disaster relief uh, money. But we did hear, again, the governor uh, of Georgia here. He was up here. He said that uh, first responders are working hard. There's still a lot of work that's left to be done. And again, uh, not backing or not backing up those claims from a foreign president. You know, Shaq, it is really fascinating to see Trump and Kemp standing next to each other after their frosty relationship yeah. after 2020. Was there any indication of that on display? I think we have some of the video from some of the briefings and some of the interactions. I'll let the body language experts <laughs> take that and see what they want to read into it. But at least based on the tone, you had the uh, former president praising Brian Kemp repeatedly. In that exchange where you saw them sitting next to one another, uh, he would go over and shake Kemp's hand, said repeatedly, oh, you're doing a great job. Here, uh, um, as we heard the two leaders speaking, we heard Brian Kemp praise the former president and thank him for coming back to Georgia for the second time this week for keeping the national attention on the recovery here. So it seems as if that uh, truce is holding up. You mentioned it was just back in August where we heard the former president going after Brian Kemp, calling him an average governor, saying he was a disloyal guy, going after his wife uh, in pretty personal terms at a rally. Things have definitely changed, and it seems you see them uh, together for the first time in about four years when, again, Brian Kemp didn't back up the former president in his attempts to overturn the election results here in the state of Georgia. That's right. But now there they are sitting next to each other with just 32 days to go until the election. Shaq, thanks so much. Marissa, let me turn to you. You are on the ground in hard hit eastern Tennessee. What are the residents there telling you? Are they getting what they need from the federal response? Well, I can tell you on the ground, I'm not really hearing that much about misinformation, at least on the ground. What I've seen online is a totally different story, of course, even in some of the local Facebook groups. I've seen a lot of comments that are casting skepticism on federal response and federal aid. But I can tell you, I have seen TEMA, which is the Tennessee Emergency Management. I have seen FEMA. And in different capacities, right? Because there is so much to be done on the ground. And that is just where we are. This is Irwin, Tennessee. That's not to mention all the other states. There are people on the ground here doing building assessments to even see if it's safe for search and rescue to go inside. We know their search and rescue just down the street from where we are. They have cadaver dogs looking through debris. This is one week after Helene, not to mention all of the recovery and the rebuilding that has to be done, aside from just finding all of the people who are still missing. You have people, including people I spoke to just yesterday, a woman who lost her home, she lost her husband, she lost her dog. She mm. does not have flood insurance. Very few people did. They didn't expect this to happen. So there's the question of rebuilding. There's the impact on agriculture, on, on the economy, the local economy here. Agriculture is a big one. There's farming fields. There are strawberry fields. There's tomato fields, which have been decimated. So there are, of course, the short-term impacts, the devastation, the grief, and all of the questions on what happens next, what happens to our local economy, because, you know, for some of these hard hit areas, their epicenters have been wiped out, particularly, of course, we've been talking about Asheville, 
Um, the devastation is so widespread that it's really at this moment still hard to grasp what the financial cost is going to be here. But again, in terms of response and relief, we've had helicopters flying overhead even in the short time that we've been here, whether it's private helicopters or airplanes, and of course, federal ones as well, delivering aid when and where they can see it. So it's a combination of all of it. But I, again, on the ground, in terms of people. I've never seen anyone turn away donations. I haven't seen uh, donations being turned away, and I haven't seen anyone turning away help from anywhere it's coming, Kristen. Great reporting, Marissa, and we can see the devastation, the work, the rebuilding that remains in that live shot behind you. Marissa, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Dasha, let me turn to you uh, as we talk about some of these baseless claims that former President Trump has made as it relates to the hurricane response. I've been talking to Republican allies, and they say the key to former President Trump winning is for him to stick to the issues where he is strongest. I am talking about the economy and immigration. Polls show he's got a lead on these issues, although that lead is narrowing. What are Trump allies telling you about this latest rhetoric that we're hearing from the president? Well, look, Kristen, I think you hit on the central frustration that you hear from Republican operatives and allies of the former president. They feel, yes, he is strong on immigration. He has reason to criticize federal response to things like this hurricane. They feel there are legitimate criticisms to be levied when it comes to how this White House has handled things at the southern border. And even FEMA, I mean, we've reported at times before on, on some of the challenges that FEMA faces. They don't often have enough resources and enough funding to do what they need to do. There has been for frustration in some of these uh, communities. There are things that you can look at and say, hey, how is the federal government handling uh, this, this massive challenge ahead? But that's not what the former president is doing. When it comes to immigration, he's making false claims about FEMA, making false claims about people eating cats and dogs, distracting from the real substantive issues. Uh, and when it comes to the federal response to this hurricane, he's uh, taking issue with, with something that's, that's, that's not real that has been fact checked and, and debunked they feel if he could just stick to the facts that there is a lane for him to be successful on these issues that's simply not happening and when you see him in georgia with governor brian kemp i mean it, it is a striking image because just months ago i was at a rally of his in atlanta kristen and he was openly in kemp state criticizing him the tables have totally turned the tone has totally changed and you look at what else has changed well when it, it was Biden at the top of the ticket, the Trump campaign felt they had Georgia in the bag. They felt mm. they had North Carolina in the bag. And so I think also some of these claims that the former president is making, trying to uh, escalate challenges in, in Georgia and in places like North Carolina, also come from a place where it's not so secure anymore that, that he is going to win those states. And the polls do have him and Harris neck and neck, Kristen. Yeah, it, it is just striking to see what has happened to the polling. Dasha, you are there in Butler, Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, the site of the first assassination attempt against former President Trump. I am sure that there are a lot of emotions for everyone who is there anticipating yeah. this visit. Uh, what are you expecting from that event tomorrow? Look, this is not insignificant for the Trump campaign. It's not insignificant for this community and for the people who were there on July 13th. I was there. I spent time with people who witnessed horrific, tragic, fatal, fatal incidents. And I went back and talked to some of those folks. And I, I got to tell you, Kristen, it, it was a similar experience to, to what I had, which is, you know, it, it has a serious impact. People have been going to trauma therapy. People uh, have been scared by loud noises. I mean, this is something that we all witnessed on television. Some people witnessed in person. And people, someone lost their life. A daughter's lost a father, a wife lost a husband, and we know that tomorrow the family of Corey Comparator will be featured as, as speakers. Uh, there will be folks who were at that rally that will be featured as speakers. Uh, local law enforcement first responders uh, will be there. You've got big names like Elon Musk coming as well, of course, running mate J.D. Vance. But for, for this community and for Western Pennsylvania at large, because people really came from all over the place, uh, even parts of Ohio for this rally, it really is an important moment to go back 
there's some discomfort with that, some concern with that, but they, the people that I've been talking to really feel that it's important uh, to finish what had started. I mean, the former president was only a few minutes into that speech when those shots rang out, and he says he wants to finish it. He wants to come back and fulfill a promise, and a lot of people around here uh, really feel that they need that for their own healing, and of course, so important to those uh, who lost a loved one that day, Kristen. Absolutely, Dasha, and uh, you showed great bravery in your reporting that day and now again going back to tell us about this event that you will be there for tomorrow. Dasha Burns, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Garrett, let me turn to you. You are, of course, normally our Trump reporter, but uh, today you're on the Harris beat. Uh, you are in Michigan. Talk a little bit about the strategy that we are seeing from the Harris campaign. She was out on the campaign trail with former Congresswoman Liz Cheney yesterday. Do you think, does the campaign feel confident that that could help to win over some of those undecided, some of those moderate voters? Yeah, Kristen, I'm taking a bit of a field trip today to get a sense of what it's like on the trail with the Harris campaign, what the crowds are like, and what the reaction's like to her. And on the issue of re reaching some of those Republicans, I think it's notable because the Harris campaign is, frankly, the only campaign trying to reach some of those, you know, call them Nikki Haley Republicans, folks who might have been traditional suburban Republicans who are not, uh, don't see themselves in Donald Trump's party. The Trump campaign has largely left those people behind. They have been mostly focused on targeting, uh, you know, kind of low information voters, particularly young men, people who maybe not even have voted in the past, but who they think will have an affinity for Donald Trump if they vote at all. And they've not done a broad spectrum outreach to traditional conservatives who are not on the Trump train. The Harris campaign, I think, rightly sees an opening there to try to invite some of those people in. And they see Liz Cheney as a potential validator. Now, Cheney obviously doesn't have a huge constituency left in this modern Republican Party. But we're not talking about huge margins, certainly not in a state like Wisconsin, where they appeared yesterday, that Joe Biden won by, I think, something like 20,000 votes four years ago. Here in Michigan, every vote could matter. And the Harris campaign has kind of a host of challenges or opportunities. They've got to shore up support with labor. They've got to shore up support among the sizable Arab American community here. And they've got to make sure that they don't lose young African American men who have been a target for the Trump campaign for a year and a half now. Now, they're not going to solve all those problems today, but Harris has already been pretty aggressive uh, in the Detroit area today on the issue of labor, and I suspect we'll hear her touch on all three of those constituencies here in Flint tonight. I think that is a safe bet. That is for sure, Garrett, and we know that next week former President Obama will be out on the campaign trail in Battleground, Pennsylvania, another big battleground state. Garrett, thanks for your great reporting, as always. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.